it. Should have done. Oh, That's wow. it. Welcome to Kathy and Susie's Kids Podcast. I'm Jordan. This is Matthew, and we're coming in live at Samui Studios with our good friend Marty Wilson. Say hello, Marty. Hey. <laughs> Uh, how, how's that hops and growers treating you right now? Man, that's good. We I, have, I want to try that summer summer wheat. Yeah, summer wheat. We got uh, o, OS House Stout. Thank you, hops and growers. They're right there in Midtown Ocean Springs. Scott is a very beautiful soul. Yeah, and, stop, uh, by and, stop by and see him. Yeah, check him out. Family owned, and he's got over 20, well, he's got about 20 beers in, in-house that he uh, he brews, and he's very passionate about it. If he doesn't have a good brew, he pours it out, because he always tells me about it, and it's, he's passionate about his trade. Got to enjoy that of it, I got. Yeah. Who's, who's getting up on that, uh, on that pour out beer? I don't know. He, nobody? Yeah, the homeless. Yeah. Um, Marty, so... I see all this jewelry and stuff on you. Is that a what? Is that yours? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of hooks. Well, you know, we used to live in Okinawa and the right islands off Japan, and we'd go to Hawaii three, four times out of the summer. So you can't help but go to that part of the world and not be inspired by that culture. But uh, these are Miori hook fish hooks. We offer them at the gallery, different sizes. But um, were you a kid when you lived over there? Yeah, my dad's retired military. He uh, flew fighter jets for 18 years for the Air Force and test piloted the SR-71. So we lived in Area 51. He flew the uh, A-1 for the CIA. And uh, then we moved out to Okinawa in Japan. And, man, I got to learn how to scuba dive, surf, fish. And just, man, that just was such an amazing upbringing as a kid. Um and he flew like 360 missions in Vietnam, and then we ended up moving here to That's Mississippi, awesome. probably 10, 11. Was your dad originally from Mississippi? No, he's he's actually from Indiana. Him and my mom are both from Indiana. She went to Indiana University, and he went to uh, Indiana uh, uh, Ball State. What so, uh what do you what got them to um, you know come to Biloxi, Mississippi? What made them the move? What what happened? Here? Well, the story I heard is he you know they came through here. And uh, before we went to Okinawa, and he said, man, that's where I want to retire because Keesler's big here, you know. And uh, so when when he retired, he said, you know, well, actually, we got stationed here, and they put him in in charge of MWR at Keesler, and then uh, took him out of the cockpit so he couldn't find the flight stick on the desk. And he was like, yeah, I'm out of here. <laughs> so when he retired, he was like, we're going to buy a fish camp. And he had found the fish camp on the point, uh, and it was called Ots at the time, and uh, bought it and turned it into Wilson's Fish Camp and uh, ended up putting me and my big brother and my twin brother on a shrimp boat, and we were shrimping. And really, to be honest with you, dude, that's where really I fell in love with the Gulf Coast and you Used to be a water. shrimper? Yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, like when you're talking about the kind of shrimp boat you have, I mean, uh, what size shrimp boat did you all have? Well, it was a fishing camp, so it was a bait boat, you know. So we'd go out right before, you know, sun comes up and catch a live bait. Had a big live bait tank on the boat itself, and then we'd pick and, you know, keep all the live shrimp and bring them in, put them in the tanks, and then sell live shrimp for to fishermen, That's you cool. know. So similar but, to what you would see down at the point now as far as the bait shops go. Yeah. Yeah. So but, my family, they got they're the galots down here. Yeah. And they have the, the big shrimp pre- processing plants. And I grew up also, you know, down there on these boats and these docks whenever I was a kid. Always infatuated with it, you know, but it was some, some pretty scenery being out there on the water, being around the fish. You always hear the good stories from, from the you know, shrimpers that are always out there, you know, because yeah. we, we did freezer boats when they were out there for a month at a time. We also did had, uh, I guess, the ice boats, and they were only out there for a couple of days at a time. Yeah. They would always come back with all these awesome stories and pictures. And yeah. It was just something, you know, I remember as, as a young age catch, capturing me and uh, just instilling that, you know, heart of the coast in me. So, yeah. so it's always nice to hear somebody else's story about yeah. it too. But I want to go back to this Area 51 stuff you just said. <laughs> all right. but, uh, any good stories? Anything that, that the world needs to know? Or Man, uh, he's... Uh, you know, he taught, he, you know, we all have that question, you know, is, is there such a thing as UFOs? And he would, you know, he would say, you know, they'd see stuff on their radar that would move like sideways up 
and then shoot out of the radar screen. And they're like, we're already test piloting the, you know, the best of the best, the best of the experimental aircraft that the, that the United States has, you know, created. And they're seeing this movement on radar. That's, you know, nothing they've ever seen. And, uh, and then the pilots that would say something about it, they'd instantly get grounded. So my dad's like, yep, we'd just Make see sure. it and not talk about it. Interesting. <laughs> and then, you know, they'd get to keep flying. But uh, I'm not going to lie because, I mean, I hang out with Marty's dad a good bit. Like, I really do. We, we love drinking margaritas together. Yeah. Every time I it's see him, drink. he's like, yeah, he's going to, uh, he always get, comes up to me and goes, hey, let's go get a drink. <laughs> you can't say no to the guy. You know, he's a, he's a hero. And and he's yeah. so cool. Uh, the air, like the whole what the, what was the plane you told me about back in the day that your dad you did uh, Area Fifty One, but he got to fly. What's that plane? It's SR Seventy One. Yeah. So actually, the te- he was test spotting the predecessor to it, which was the YF Twelve, and then it turned into the SR. But, I think uh, it was around that time. Yeah. It's like he did a lot of. I think he worked for the CIA. Yeah. I mean, I, it, I I know some stories too about your dad. I mean, it's yeah. it was uh, the. World's fastest man-made aircraft ever made, and it did Mach three and a half plus. You remember uh, Broken Arrow? Remember that movie Broken Arrow? Like yeah. back that big, wide-looking plane. That's that's what he's talking about. Yeah. Blackbird. That's awesome. The Habu. They and how old it. were you when all this was going on? Oh, I was probably eight, seven, well, eight so years old. So old enough to remember it, you know? Very yeah, well. some of it. Uh, you know, we lived at Kadena Air Force Base in Okinawa, and when the SR would take off you knew it you hear it yeah Yeah, because it was it was made out of titanium and they had to build it loose so when it took on fuel it leaked like a sieve so when they'd put it on the flight deck they'd run the fuel tank truck out and then they'd pump it with fuel and as soon as the tank car uh tank truck pulled away he'd fire up and take off and shoot straight up You know, Can we and do just again? as fast as he could. So then when you got up in atmosphere, the plane would tighten up and all the metal would contract and then stop the fuel tanks from leaking. That's Isn't that crazy? crazy? Yeah. They, and there's no way they could, you know, they, like that's what they did, though? They couldn't they fix it? They have to or it would implode. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't want to. What, what, you, what year was this, if you don't mind? 70s. 70s. I wonder what Okinawa was like <clears> in the 70s. It was pretty cool. We'd run... Me and my twin brother, we'd run the boondocks and all the, uh, in the boondocks, it had all these caves and stuff from the Okinawan War. So we'd go explore through these caves and stuff and we'd bring, you know, uh, different pieces of live ammunition, you know, uh, machine gun belts, you know, and we'd put all the machine gun belts together and then take all the shells and put them in all the machine gun belts. And then we'd bring home live ordnance and my mom would be like... Stop bringing that home. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, I want to know about it, the, the Okinawa and the, and the trips before even coming to the coast. Because you, you used to tell me some stories that y'all used to do, um, with the, the lifestyle y'all lived. I mean, your dad was a pretty wild guy. Well, you were talking about, you know, uh, drinking margaritas with dad. You know, he's really a scotch drinker. And he talks about, because he had thrown, flown, you know, 368 missions in Vietnam and every night when they'd come in from flying those missions, if they lost a pilot, they'd drink a fifth of scotch. Ooh. He Ooh. said, what? Oh, wait, he said, after 368 missions, they did not drink scotch three nights. Dang. That sucks. You know. And love and memory. I mean, and then he ended up landing seven dead sticks, dropping napalm on Ho Chi Minh Trail. I mean, he's, he's the real deal. He's how many really times he wrecked? True. How, many, how many times did your dad crash? He never did. He never did. No, one of his uh, one of his air missions. Uh, he said the guys on the flight deck counted uh, ninety eight holes in his plane from any aircraft <laughs> from one one mission. And, and and guys, keep this in mind. There there was no time time back in the day. There was no GPS. Uh uh-uh. So he really. I mean, you're out there. Yeah. 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 Instruments barely rearview mirrors. Dude, yeah, like, not <laughs> electronic shots. Like yeah. right. I mean, right. he got hit with some shots, and yeah. he can't do Hey, what's up? Yeah. It's. He said the A1, the Warthog, uh, I mean, the A10, they, he said the Gatling gun under it, when they would fire it, he said it had so much recoil that it would almost stop the plane. And they had to take their finger off the trigger to, to get their airspeed back up, and they're sitting in a three-inch steel bathtub taking any aircraft underneath. Yeah. Just, That's crazy. 
I think, uh, you know, I'm, there's definitely something that the pilots today don't have to deal with, thank you, the Lord. Right. Um, but those guys definitely paved the way for it, you know, and we couldn't be here where we are without That's them. That's right. So. And, I, and I thank him all the time because without guys like that out there watching the front gate for us, I wouldn't be able to ch- chase the American dream like I get to do today because these young guys growing up right now, they don't really understand freedom isn't free, man. There was a price that was paid for us to be able to live in America and be able to pursue what we want to do to chase our passions and chase our dreams and make them real. That's right. And it, uh, and without that, yeah, the show wouldn't be around and, and a lot less paintings would happen. That's right. You know, that's right. So let's talk about that. You know, I know uh, you're kind of a world world renowned, famous marine artist. Uh, they just opened up the the aquarium down there. You got some work done there. Not the aquarium. No, not yeah. yet. No. Okay, that, I thought, I'm at Ocean Adventures. Okay, Ocean yeah. Adventures. I haven't been down there to check it out yet, no. so I'm a little, a little. The aquarium's still got some work to do, and they might bring me in at the end. All but, right. Uh, uh, they're trying. They got. They got to satisfy their architectural renderings and the guidelines to get it to look exactly like what they've gotten to get their contract money right yeah man screw all that noise for that experience with uh the ims um i got to watch it i would i would i would go a couple times like you know like i'd talk about feeding them like we'd feed them like i just go watch them man and it is that is always say this is very tough for an artist to go that big you know you know i see marty doing his canvas but marty's canvases like uh we got right here uh that triple tails right we need to take Jordan fishing more. Yeah, yeah. What, what is it? What is it? <laughs> yeah, I don't know anything about fishing, but anyways, <laughs> it's th- a that, speckle trout. That speckle trout painting. What is it, what is it called? Double trouble. Yeah, double yeah. trouble. Um, that painting took Marty three hundred hours. Goodness, that three hundred hours to paint that. He layers his painting and he puts his passion. In it. And I remember him telling me that three hundred hours it took that to do that. So every piece of Marty's art is, it's a piece of him. You get a Marty Wilson piece. Of his heart. Yeah. I mean, it's all through well, emotion. Well, here's the deal, guys. I mean, any, you know, my mom had taught me a long time, any, anything we're doing is we're doing right. And really, I, I paint for me and always trying to master the paintbrush. And I love doing my art. And so when I'm doing the details around the eye and all those little tiny things that I enjoy, and that, that's what I get out of it. And a lot of times all that something really cool happens while that painting's evolving, you know, I'm like, man, dude, check that out, man. That's, a, and I turn around and I look and there's nobody there because it's three o'clock in the morning and I'm up by myself <laughs> just doing my thing, you know what right. I mean? But, but the excitement uh, that you get behind it, you yeah. know, the, that's the fire yeah. that keeps it coming, keeps it fresh, you yeah. know. Um, and I know, you know, I've been around for you to, to describe several of your paintings and uh, each one has a story and that's what is unique about it to me. It's not like anybody's no. out there just, no painting free or anything like that. Like you actually, you, you live the moment that's in your pain, kind of like Jordan said. Um, so with that being said, you know, which one's your favorite one? Which one's your best? I know our, I know you, every artist is a crit, uh, the hardest critic on themselves. Um, so, well, so that's, out of all your that's, work, you know? that's hard. I've got favorite paintings and then I've got favorite stories okay. that go behind those paintings. This is certainly, you know, one of them because it's, it's, you know, it's, it's called double trouble. My mom, used to call me and my twin brother double trouble okay. <laughs> so Makes but, sense. but cool. that, you know in that painting is is my dad he's surf fishing at chandelier that's his boat in the background that's uh uh mike chester there by his boat that's from the point you know uh he always wore the little white uh uh tank top <laughs> Yeah. Shy of saying whatever <laughs> men usually call those. But, you know, uh, so I had to put that in the painting. My dad's taken a chandelier since I was, you know, a kid. Right. So the passions run deep there on the whole speckle trout fishing because that's his deal. You know, he's a trout dude from Jump Street. And I always talk about trout guys. You know, they just have that pheromone that comes out of their skin. It's just is just trout yeah it's just fishy like that that's right and my dad had that you know uh me you know growing up at the fish camp we had sequels reef right there and me and my twin brother had you know free access to uh free live shrimp for life so we were always out there trout fishing so i've caught enough to fill up my house and i enjoy that and and that whole sunset at chandelier 
wade fishing. Oh, there's a qualm in the universe that happens right there that's Never magical. Been. It's magical. It is. It but is. I, I got bit by the blue water bug and offshore, and that's kind of where my heart is, where yeah. I'm always trying to get Thank to. Thank you, Kyle Mallet. All right. the time. So I haven't made my chance out there. Oh, why is that? Because I used to ride on the boat with Kyle Mallet. Yeah. Well, that's probably your mis- first mistake right there. I'm scared. I've been on the boat with Kyle Mallet a couple of times. It's not that. It's not all it's cracked up to be, so. <laughs> Kyle, love you. But yeah. now I'll go on the boat with you again, Kyle. Just call me. <laughs> no, no. But, uh, Love you though, Kyle. I feel like I gotta have a heavy mix in between, you know, so the inshore and the offshore. I've recently, you know, I guess, the older I've gotten and the more money I've I've been able to make, I've been able to spend more on some offshore fishing. It is quite more expensive than the inshore fishing. Oh yeah. Um, but but speckle trout, you can't go wrong with it. To me, it's the it's the best tasting fish out there. Uh, uh, I think you know the only other one I really like up there with is is tuna. And fresh tuna to me, you can't beat it. But but a speckled trout, you know, fresh fried speckled trout, or even baked. I mean, it, it's just you can't you can't go wrong with it. Uh, but the fight that they get, you know, they hit they hit it so hard. Whenever it comes up to the top of the water, uh, and, and then you know they immediately start to turn their heads on it, and that's that's to me fun. And the finesse game of not turning his mouth open because yeah. he's paper mouth. But that's right. There's you know every species has its own you know technique and challenges, but. Uh, you know, man, blue water. I ended up, you know, been lucky to, you know, fish the tur- tournament f- trail and and fish, you know, for blue marlins for twenty five years. So, you know, haven't had to pay for that because knowledge is power. So, That's you right. know, I was just I tried to get really good at that. So I ended up, you know, uh, on the cock in the cockpit of some really phenomenal boats, and I was. Uh, Ran the cockpit on the Rainmaker for the Blackledges for, I think, nine years. And uh, before that was Bobby Culberson, who owned all the Astro Lincoln Mercuries. He had the Astro, uh, the Astro 4, and I was uh, with him for six years. And then there was, oh, Doug Newman, it's on the, you know, he, he does the uh, Mahogany Imports. Uh, and then I've fished with probably, you know, everybody on the coast that, uh, I've been lucky enough to be invited on their boat. We're going to have to round something up and make something happen. I'm down. Go maybe create another story where we can get a painting off of it. Yeah, that's always my excuse. Yeah, exactly. Like, i got to go do some field research, guys. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Chandelier, like, like, okay, this painting right here of your father, and of course we're going to show you guys the the painting, but um, so when when you're talking about Chandelier, like the way it feels, is that like, I mean, is this a morning thing or this like – was it how probably happens two times a day out there? Okay, if the weather's right. And, um, I need to go out there, I've never been. And it's I, magical. I love Chandelier, as you see. I love Cam, Kane, Dave, and the crew. And uh, it's just part of something you know that the coast brings. You know, I, I've been to some other islands, I've been to the Bahamas, and, and I've, it's been pretty, you know, beautiful there too. Don't get me wrong, but I've never caught fish there like I have at Chandelier. You know, when the sun comes up, the sun comes down and the tide's at that right angle. It's almost oh. just like the salinity of the water. It's all perfect. It, it comes together. You don't have to be around anybody. It's, it's, it's like you're at one with yourself and, and nature. And the uh, fish are chewing. And the fish are biting. Yeah. They're chewing, man. <laughs> yeah. They are chewing. Uh, every cast, you know. And, and we're not talking about little keepers that you got to measure and throw away. Really? They're all big, big lunkers. I want to so. go. Let's go right now. I'm down. We'll you get got, back I mean, my you truck a, up to my a, boat. Yeah, you got a big Mako. Yeah, we're, we're we're rewiring it right now. I got my uh, buddy Kyle Johnson hooking me up. Well, right if now. anybody out there wants to take a fish in the chandelier, we'll. Uh, yeah, and yeah, <laughs> we'll definitely check out that speck it, speckled truth. Yeah, the speckled truth. That, you know, uh, that's what Kyle was telling me about at your, your art show. Kyle was talking yeah. about is he, he's a part of that? Oh yeah, they're doing a booth uh, this weekend at the uh, boat show. So yeah, I mean we might go hang out with them. I really. Trey Cherry is one of my best friends. I talk about all, like Trey all the time. Love him to death. Love Trey. And having him, he's always he always brings food. So do you. So I always have like always have meat. Tuna meat. Oh, I got to tell you this story. Okay. So he so he's so he calls me up. He says, "Man, I got these beautiful grouper fillets. Somebody gave me. One of my friends gave me. He says, man, I don't I don't know what to do with it. Come 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 over and cook it for me. I went, okay, okay. So I show up over there. I got the grouper fillets out, and I'm looking for seasonings. You know. And I open up one of his cabinets on his in his kitchen, and there's nothing in there but ammo. And I open the next cabin, there's nothing in there but ammo. And it's the next cabinet, it's nothing, his whole kitchen cabinet, the whole thing's full of freaking ammo. <laughs> I'm like, where's your seasonings? I, I don't, I don't, 
I don't know if I got any. <laughs> I was back then. I was a single guy, and I uh, felt like having my ammo in my kitchen. Doomsday preppers. What I'm, a great. Give story. me some cheddar wursts, pizza rolls, and ramen noodles, dude. I still love ramen noodles. Yeah, and that's me and Emily ramen noodles like four days a week. Yep. And some ammo for the scar seventeen. <laughs> scar seventeen. <laughs> that uh, Marty did. That is actually my scar. Um, yeah, Marty did my scar at his house. At, like, yeah, those is a project we did, and I can't believe you let me put paint on a five thousand dollar gun. That's three thousand. <laughs> it's actually probably I think I paid three thousand. Oh, okay. but still, still turned out good. <laughs> Thanks. When you have Marty Wilson, I was like, oh, you're gonna let me paint it? Oh, I'm in. <laughs> Look, y'all want to take a break real quick? Sure. Right, we sure. got some time uh, to, to chill out. Yeah, go ahead. All right, folks, and we're back, uh, picking up right where we left off. Got our good friend Marty Wilson here with us, uh, drinking on some good brew uh, from. This is really good. Yeah, Hops and Growlers, downtown Ocean Springs. Uh, go give them a go give them a holler. Uh, they'll hook you up. But uh, making a few shout outs right now. I think we also wanted to give a, a good shout out to our, our friend Jared Seymour over at Brownwater Bander. Uh, out there putting on a good vibe for everybody on the coast. And, um, and uh, no, well, it's not just uh, Jared Seymour. It's actually Joey Cates. Remember Joey Cates from school? Yeah, I do remember Joey. Joey Cates just joined up with Jared Seymour. Two great guys. Joey Cates is a, uh, I think he's a wood shop teacher and, a, and he's a coach. At St. Martin. At Diarville. Oh, is it Diarville? He's a, yeah, he's a Diarville coach and okay. he's a wood, he's, he does, he teaches wood class. He, they make, all his students make beautiful stuff. But Jared is a nurse anesthetist, a musician, beautiful voice. And a great dad. We, me and Emily do events with him sometimes. We, like, I love Heather. I love the, the, the kids. Uh, but Jared, he kind of, you know, he, he was one of the guys that got me into podcasts, too, with Scott. Right. I know me and him had several discussions about it. So Jared is a great podcaster. And you're wearing a shirt. Yeah, this like is uh, the Brownwater Bantering shirt. So, yeah, it's cool right here. Look at this. Right when he dropped this shirt, I got it. Dope. I've got the team doghouse fishing shirt on for our good friend. I like Austin Chandler. I like that Austin uh, Chandler. Yeah, yeah, dude, yeah. Austin, you got some style, bro. Yeah, man, he stepped it up big last year and uh, started a, a fishing team. I and mean, they're on, uh, they're on Instagram. I think it's dog, dog team, dogfish. Love that dude because he invites me over for Christmas. Yeah, awesome Christmas party. I love his Christmas parties. Like, hey, man, you coming this year? And they also have the doghouse, uh, two locations, Biloxi and Gulfport. And the one he operates is uh, the one is right there in Gulfport, right here by the house. Yeah. Yeah, they'll watch your dogs. They'll they'll sit them. They'll uh, bathe them, and all the good stuff. And so. Marty's right there too. Marty Wilson Gallery is not not far from the road. Right. And tell us about your shirts, Marty. I know we given we've given one away so far in our our uh, our first episode with Nick. <sighs> Man, the 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 shirt line has just constantly evolved. You know, <clears throat> my mom always tells me you just got to keep reinventing yourself. You know, but. Uh, you know, we've got some cool new dry fits at the gallery and some uh, some blended, you know, poly tees that are really nice and comfortable and soft. But uh, that's the one we gave uh, away to Nick. That yeah. really cool, like Marty Wilson original. The branded stuff. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. And where and can then, they find those? Is, are they online or they got to come they're see They're at you? MartyWilson.com. MartyWilson.com. And then uh, the gallery was right there, uh, right at, on Pass Road across from Tea Garden. And don't sell yourself short. He also does framing. Really yeah. nice custom framing. Yeah, we offer custom framing. We do uh, Photoshop photo rest restoration. I mean, they, you we're probably the only place on the coast that offers that. I mean, that was such a product from, you know, Katrina when, you know, it made you realize that just about everything that you own is disposable. Yeah. Except for our jewelry, our guns, you know, uh, and our family photographs. Right. And everything else we own is just totally disposable. So those family photographs came flooding in after Katrina. And then, you know, you got this, you know, lady coming in going, this is the only photograph I have left of my mother. I mean, it just was heartbreaking. And, and we were the ones that could restore that and then reprint it and give it back to them, you know, the way it was before it got water damaged overnight i know that means a lot lost so much yeah i had a lot of family that lost everything yeah. and, and and we healed a lot that was of, included healed a lot of families with those with those services so he told me photoshop that's good no that's like like when you see when i if i do logos any graphic stuff you see marty sat down one day and for hours and taught me how to use photoshop it's a lot of patience marty <laughs> I don't really know how much I taught him. He was pretty I good know. to I'm get. Just, yeah. I know. I kind of knew Photoshop, but Marty taught me like some old school tricks. Like I did, I started in C5 
And Marty started when Photoshop was Photoshop. Oh, the Apple computer, I think, was a little Green square. screen. You know, and then it no, went no. to the pod thing. Um, but, so uh, I got a question, and then this is kind of, I was going to drop this on you, but uh, Marty, you did uh, you used to do screen printing. We did screen printing, you know, I uh, when I was, you know, growing up on a shrimp boat, I was like, I got to I gotta get away from this, man. My hands are peeling from shrimp acid. You know, there was a trip that... Thorns we, in your fingers. Oh, man, everything you touch, you know, the manis shrimp would hit you five times before you could throw it, you know, as you're picking everything, lights you on fire or stings you or bites you, you know. And, uh, and I remember one trip, it was right there at daybreak, and we're putting the nets out, and, uh, and my big brother's got, turns the boat hard right, you know, and, uh, and I went over and then I came up and it's still kind of dark 30 and I came up and I came up under the net, Ooh. grabbed a hold Ooh. of the shrimp trawl. I'm being drug upside down under the shrimp trawl. I had a beanie on the beanie flipped down over my face, soaking wet. I'm in the dark. I'm under the net going oh my goodness here uh, come take me i'm i'm done yeah. <laughs> and uh and i and i crawled to the edge of the net and then got up on top of the net and my and my brother's dragging me on top of the net he doesn't even know i fell over and then i start yelling and he pulls the throttles back and he it's like what the hell are you doing back there on the nets you know so he pulls the nets in and gets me back on the boat but you know uh those experiences m have really made me who i am today but you know i was like that's Eventually, not the life you want. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> and I was, it. you know, my mom taught art in the school systems for like 18 years. So we were doing that at home and painting at home. And I was playing guitar. I was playing sports. Me and my twin brother thought we were going to go pro playing baseball. And I just thought I was a ball player. I never really looked at myself as an artist. And so when we were doing that and growing up doing that, my mama really was pushing the art side of this thing. And, and uh, my dad ended up getting his bachelor's degree in fine art and uh, or his uh, uh, um, uh, minor was in fine art. And he taught art in the co college level at Indiana University. Okay. So my, both my parents knew where this was coming from with me doing the art thing, you know. But uh, I was thinking, man, I got to get away from the fish camp, you know. And I, and I went down, I think it was... Uh, uh, my junior year at high school, and we went and did senior break, and we went down to Fort Lauderdale. I mean, not Fort Lauderdale, Fort Walton, <laughs> and and walked into an airbrush t-shirt shop, and I'm watching this guy paint shirts, and I'm looking at a shirt rack, and he's got like 35 shirts there, and all of them have tickets with prices on it. So I'm flipping through the shirts, counting his money for him, and I'm thinking, man, he's painting a shirt every freaking six minutes. I'm like, this guy's killing it. Right. So I went home. Bought me a, a, a Pache VL3 double action airbrush gun, sat in my bedroom and learned how to use that thing. And it took me about three months to really get it down pat. <laughs> and uh, I was 16. I went down to Ed Bozier's gift shop and I walked in there and there was only one airbrush artist on the coast. And uh, uh, his name was Kevin Higginbotham, I think. No. Yeah, maybe at the, at the Buena Vista. At the Buena Vista. That's a long time ago. And he was in the gift shop, the Buena Vista, and I was like, I can do this. And he and Ed Bozier hired me. I went in there. I said, how'd you like to triple your T-shirt sales? He says, well, that'd be pretty pretty slick, son. How are you going to do that? And I said, we're not only going to triple them. We're going to sell blank T-shirts. Like, that really caught him off guard. So he's so he's like, how, how are we doing that? I said, I'm not airbrushing. He, I had to educate him what airbrushing was. He let me do it. We sold blank. He sold his blank T-shirts. I gave him 25% of everything that I painted, and I painted shirts that summer. So I ended up airbrushed T-shirts for 10 years and then went into screen printing, and we had a screen print shop for four years, and I was licensed with uh, LSU, Southern Ole Miss, Mississippi State, wow. Alabama, that's, that's Florida Gators, and I was doing designs for all these universities, and then I would send the artwork to their home office, they would okay them and we'd sell them to the bookstores. That's awesome. And then we'd sell them to the Foot Lockers, Athletic Addicts, in the malls around those campuses. So we we were doing quite was, well. Was Ed that. still getting his cut at this point? Oh. Who? Ed Bozier. Oh, no, 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 no. 
Yeah, no. no, no, I know Ed. He's a good guy. Yeah. He's a good friend of mine. He's in the Rotary Club with me. He's right, actually right. one of our Neptune brothers. He was the king of Love Neptune it. one year. Yeah, yeah. Dear friend, I did not know that. That's how you know Dear the friend. t-shirt business started for you. That's pretty hook, line, and yeah. sinker. Yeah, that's awesome. The restaurant, hook, line, and uh-huh. sinker, and then the gift shop right there. Um, but uh, you know, it, it, you can only do that for so long. So right. I'm like, you know what? There's more to this whole thing with art than this. And I went home. And I called my mom and I went, Mom, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I, I, I don't want to do this anymore. She said, what do you, don't wanna, what do you want to do, son? And I said, I want to paint. I want to paint paintings. I want to be able to give you a, 100% of my effort instead of just what you're willing to pay for. And she goes, well, son, go home and paint. That's good advice. So I walked away from the screen print shop, which I owned a third of, set up my spare bedroom, and I painted the ship on lighthouse. That was my first painting I ever painted, and uh, and put it into print and did limited edition prints. And my mom, she was like, "Well, now we need a studio." So That's we right. so we opened what? a studio in the Dantzler house that was behind the lighthouse. It's no longer gone because K- Katrina took it, and uh, and we had a computer, and I was selling prints to individual people hand delivering them to their houses and then putting their name and address and everything oh, in the cool. computer. And I had a customer base and then I'd record their number in the books of what print number they got. And then when I come out with a new print, I'd contact them. I have your number saved. Right. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Building and, then your I would, network. and then I'd educate them on if they collect the same number in all the prints, it's called a suite. So a suite of prints is more collectible as, as a collection. So they were like, yeah, yeah. So I'd keep, I would keep selling them the same number because I'd hold it for them. Right. And my mother just really has been my inspiration my whole life. And then we uh, opened a gallery, our first gallery, true gallery in the Vu Marche in Biloxi. And, uh, and they put us on the Main Street program. And then we uh, did the Biloxi's Tricentennial 300 yeah. print. And then we did Afghans for that you and raised that money. Print? Yeah. That was you? Yeah. Yeah. I want to print. I know. I didn't. I love that print. I was like, I used to see it uh, when it, Cedar Lake they used to have it out when they did the, like they did like a. I think that advertisement for it. Oh, I think oh. that's what I seen. Like the oh. Centennial print, three hundred years. And we raised a bunch of money for that, and and we're the ones that pulled all the awnings in the Vu Marche and made it where you can drive back through it again because it turned it into a walking mall yeah. and it killed it, killed it. And then as downtown, to see Blexing. what they've done there now has been impressive. It's huge. Yeah, because you see the old pictures, like, from back in the, I guess, the early 20s and 30s and 40s of that area, yeah. whenever it was big and wide. And right. They had all the big industrial buildings there. And then to see what, the, what it came to when we were kids, it was kind of sad. Yeah. But yeah. we did talk about the Vue Marche some on our last episode with Nick. You know, that's where his murals are going now. So I want to, uh, real quick with that, Matt, I do want to do a shout-out to Maritime. That's where Corey Christie works with the Maritime. Yeah. And uh, I went to the restroom in the Maritime. Guess what they had? The museum? Yeah, guess what they had in there? In the restroom. <laughs> Seafood festival, Marty Wilson. <laughs> yeah, and that's kind of you, you. In the stalls or in the urinals or uh, <laughs> I don't know. the lobby uh, no, or where? Kind of probably in the lobby area, but <laughs> that to me is surreal because I'm not big into fishing. I don't know anything. I really the well, it's fitting. The painting downstairs, Big Mo, for a long time until Trey Cherry told me that it's a uh, not a lionfish, Jordan. I thought it was a lionfish from Deuce Bigelow, and. <laughs> Marty, I didn't know. He never told me. He just gave it to me as a gift because we work and we always work together. So he, he loves giving gifts to me, and I love his art. I just don't know the fish. I thought it was well, that now line. You know. Well, but it, it, I had it for a year in there, and I would come up and be proud of it and be like, hey, this is a lionfish. And I would talk proud of it, <laughs> and nobody said anything. And then uh, it was a NOS. What, what is it? It's not a NOS, but what is it called? The Nassau group. Nassau. See, I don't know anything about yeah. fishing. Thank you, Kyle Mallet. <laughs> I, I love Kyle. tell us about big mo and i know i've heard the story before uh but, oh, but go into the inspiration behind it and um i think we got we got some open ears that are going to be interested in this one right so. on um you know as i paint these paintings they're really just slices of my own experiences and what i've lived in my lifetime and you know uh growing up in okinawa my dad threw us in the water with tanks when we were like six, you know, scuba diving. Cause back then you didn't even really need to be certified. certified. Yeah. It was like, breathe son, you know, <laughs> just breathe, you know? And then once we figured that out, we took to it like fish. And, uh, so I've loved scuba diving my whole life. And then, uh, we get here 
and I love diving, you know, the our vertical reefs here, the oil rigs, but Cozumel, man, is unbelievable. Oh, it's beautiful down there. And that whole side of the island is all national park, so everything's protected, so everything grows to its full like life expectancy. So the groupers are huge. The lobsters are 20-pound, you know, bugs mm-hmm. this big, and they're, you know, they push up off the bottom. They're, like, this tall. And uh, we were diving a, a reef there that's called Palancar. It's Palancar Gardens. It's unbelievable. And uh, and it's all drift diving. So when you hit the bottom, you get neutrally buoyant. What is drift diving real quick? Drift diving's the, the the current's moving so bad, you don't even have to kick yeah, your you flippers. Kick your legs. You don't have to do nothing. I want to so, do that. So you check this out. And you just hook. Right. So when you're scuba diving, you're trying to get neutrally buoyant with your BC. So when you get to the bottom... You just pop a little air in your BC and so you it lifts up. you up off the bottom and you get neutral. So you're not ascending or descending. You're just Floating. neutral. And then the current's pushing you. So when you get to a coral head and you come up to it, you just take a breath and you hold your breath and you lift and you get to the other side and you blow out and you drift down the back of the other side. And then you look at everything. So diving really is just trying to be in control of your own emotions to control your breathing because you want to stay down there as long as you can. Yeah, I'm and, not any good at that either. Yeah. The, the, I'm not either. Well, I, I've trained myself. But well, y'all both know. I mean, I have CP, you know, cerebral palsy. Uh, I can't feel really my right foot that much, so I don't really have that. You'd be good at it. Would be perfect. I, I can't flat. I can't <laughs> flat my foot because I really. I mean, it's kind of. I have no <laughs> real feeling. I don't. I don't know. I mean, little feeling, but I've always wanted to be like a scuba diver. I try to join the Navy, and they're like, no, no. So, but like my leg, my function of my legs, but I've always wanted to be a scuba diver, and Matt. When I was growing up, Matt and his dad, Mr. Robert, loving Mr. Robert, cool dude, really cool dude. But that's what he did with Matt. Like, they'd be like, hey, we're going treasure hunting. And him and his mom would take Matt, and they would do it. But I always wanted to do it, but I have have a, have a, have a broken fin. So I'm sitting here going, ah, oh, I want to do it. I really I, I, I want to do it. You can do anything you want to when you put your mind to it. Neo. Uh, I'm thinking about as I get older, like, let's go Maybe do it. Maybe we should it. go to Palancar Gardens. I think if we can do that, I really want to go scuba diving. There's drift diving there, I hear. So that so that's big mo. So we're pounding car, and uh, you know it's it's uh, the the feeding the fish is kind of frowned upon, and they weren't really pushing that right at the moment. So all I did was tell my little boat captain, you know, that I wanted to feed the fish because I had a nice little CNC yeah. underwater dive camera. I was going to take pictures. I'm there for the paintings. I I want to take pictures to find my next paintings, and uh, and we had dove there probably three years in a row in the summer. So I knew the black, these big black groupers were living on pound car because there was probably about uh, three or four of them there that were in that 60 pound plus category. That's huge. That's a big fish. Huge for black. And, uh, and so I, I told him, Hey man, uh, you know, give me some, get me some fish. So we ran down the beach, pulled up and then he pulled the throttle back, dives off the front of the road, swims to the beach swims runs up the beach runs up to this little thatch roof restaurant and uh comes running back down the beach he's got a ziploc baggie full of some fresh fish fillets puts it in his mouth swims back to the boat climbs on the back and walks straight up to me and hands it to me and i'm like oh yeah <laughs> you know so we get to pound car hit the bottom slide over and we're 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 moving in between these coral heads and uh one of them comes out you know, and down there you take the you take the fish and you just do your hand like this, and they swim right up to it, and you turn it over and you float it, and he <laughs> sucks it up. You know, because they're vacuum feeders, and uh, and so I'm popping pictures of them. Well, he got the attention of a couple more. Next thing you know, it I got four of these big school buses in front of me, and I'm feeding them. This Nassau comes up behind me and t- tucks in behind my tank, and I look over my shoulder and I float him some fish. He sucks it up and he tucks back in. So I did that a couple times and I took a couple pictures of him thinking he was cool, but he was only like six to eight pounds. He wasn't that big. And I'm super impressed with these blacks and I'm still taking pictures thinking that's my painting. The painting is of the blacks. And 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 he wasn't coming out from behind me because he didn't want to have nothing to do with the business right. end out in front of me because every one of them could have ate him. Easily. And probably would have. Yeah. How about for a guy that doesn't really know anything about the size of the fish? Six, you said six to eight pounds. What do they normally get? Nassau's? 
I, um, I think a big Nassau might be 15, 20 pounds. I, I don't have enough experience. I'm sure there's Nassau's. bigger ones than that. But Bahamas. Yeah, that sounds about right. Bahamas. Well, I'm, guys, I'm just asking yeah. for people like me. I mean, the go, Goliath, Goliaths about? are the biggest, right? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah. and then I guess what's after that? Warsaw. Warsaw. And then you're black, probably. Uh, I don't get, know. There's probably 25 different kind of groupers. So Yeah. I drank yeah. A, uh, One night I drank a bourbon, and I looked at that painting for 45 minutes. I was just like studying it. I was like, wow, because because Marty always did the whole. When he told me he did three hundred hours, I'm like, what did it take? How do you feel? Like I always want to know what 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 they're doing. Like Marty, you know, exhausted. And honestly, we're close friends. If he's upset, there goes a paintbrush. If he's happy, there's a paintbrush. So you really don't know. Like if he's, it depends. And it's like, dude, don't call me. Don't talk to me. I'll see you in three days. That's how you picked him out, right? You said you were flipping through the photos and and you saw all the pictures Man, of, the, of the blacks. The and- picture of the Nassau just stood out. And I, you know, I painted it and I ended up doing it. I, at the time, I had just gotten a commission uh, by the uh, Lady Luck Casino and they wanted a twenty eight. I miss that dragon mural. And behind the cage. So I did this, uh, and I called it the Predator's Reef, and uh, put this group, this Nassau grouper, in the mural. And uh, and then we ended up shooting pictures of it because I wanted to print it because it, it was super cool. And then I was trying to come up with a name, and my mama was like, oh, you got to name him Big Mo. And I was like, okay, okay. Because she didn't really understand that he was just a little fish, but I was like, the painting in the mural, he's like, you know, four foot by four foot. So he kind of looked like he was large and in charge with his big lips. And she's like, okay, Big Mo fits. We're going to call him Big Mo. So, you know, that was kind of a the color, cool little deal. The color of Big, like, what was your inspiration to, to use the colors that you, you did in that painting? That was, that was. That's what it looks like? I mean, well, yeah, the colors, of the pa- the fish or the water. Cause like all together, like when you look, not the fish itself, but around the painting, it's got that. Well, we were on about a uh, how many colors eighty foot mean? dive, so it was it was pretty dark. It wasn't that light down there, and it was kind of overcast that day. So that was kind of the colors that was in the photograph that I shot. So I tried to stay true to that in the creative process because, awesome. you know, um, you know, having original work is where it's at these days so oh yeah you know painting from your own experiences painting from your own photographs i mean that's what sets you apart i think me personally but no doubt well tell us about some of the other projects that you've done i know you know people can see your work down at the reef we got the big mural down there um you know you got a new one over in the the blue marlin uh what is that the centennial bicentennial plaza just finished the blue marlin restaurant that was that was fun great place great people Shout out to together. Kono, man. What Love a fantastic. Him and Greg did a fantastic job. We were so lucky to have that little jewel here on the coast. I mean, I'd say it's probably the closest thing somebody's gotten to the Broadwater. Awesome. And we lost that. Have you yeah. got to see it? Have so, you been inside there? Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it. It's, it's, the restaurant? Yeah. Beautiful. Wow. Phenomenal was, food. I was taken back. Great chef. New style yeah. paintings. Great chef. Anything else? What did you got else in the works? Anything good coming up? Man, I'm I'm uh, working on my new apparel line for for 2020 spring right now. So oh yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. <laughs> Got some camo coming, Jordan Duron. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Marty Wilson be, will be dropping a Giataku camo. I'm calling it out right now on the podcast. <laughs> it's gonna be insane. So go ahead and try to do it. But like the Giataku camo, yeah, that he's been working on for a couple of years. You're gonna love it. Like. Well, I, I'm a fan of Giyotaku to begin with. But I, mean, I try to dabble in it myself. It's a blend of species. It's 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 he's gonna take it to another level because it's gonna speak to you. It's gonna be soft, but you're gonna enjoy to wear the dry fit and you're gonna want to, you can take it on the boat, you can take it out to dinner. That's that's always a plus. So, I'm excited. And, and really that whole thing started from being exposed to that in Japan and being exposed to that art culture over there which is amazing i mean you know we're such a young country here in the right. united states compared to the rest of the world so you know uh uh seeing that over there and then i had done a few giatakus there in high school and then never really had a reason to do it and then i remember one of my good friends dennis Mines, comes to me with like a 28 pound triple tail i mean a slab and he goes 
man, I want you to do a fish print of it. And I was like, oh, I've been waiting for Perfect. somebody to ask me, you know. And I did my first one with him, and I want to say that was like uh, maybe 94, 95, somewhere in there. Scott's got a 96. Scott's got a 96. Shout out to Scott Snapper. Levenway. Love That's you, dude. Right. That's right. He made this table. You know, and you can, you know, this is these are the things you hope for because you do things in life with your passions and loving playing music and those type of things. And you do it long enough where people start to pay you to do that. So, you know, I was painting fish, but I was also painting historical things and the lighthouses and the Vuba home. And, uh, you know, and I'm painting fish kind of on the side for me going, this is for me, this is my, you know, deal that I'm getting a lot out of it self gratification yeah and then and then eventually people start paying you to do that because if your passion is real it it shines through oh, and yeah. people see it this little lot and of they mine, go you gotta yeah, let it shine you bet that's right. you bet and that's a great lesson for all those young artists out there is just straight stay true to yourself do you and it'll come just just put the work in and do it and chase your heart and chase your dreams. You yeah. Know? Nothing's going to be given to you. Um, and with, with it being said, this is going to be, yeah, we're going to have Marty back on. Um, but yeah, d- make sure you check out and, 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 and do the Kobe tag. I mean, there's 300 friends out there of Marty's that Marty's been there for you. He's done so many things for you. He's, he's, and I know this cause I'm r- around sign up for that tag and, and, and let's make a difference because you know, Kyle Johnson, CCA, Marty Wilson, that's what they're doing. They're not. They're Put one money. back. The Put speckled back. truth. Yeah. Spe- yeah. And one golf, one goal. Austin Chandler, Doghouse. Yeah, doghouse Vision Team. Marty Wilson, Brownwater Bantron. So, I Geek just. Of guns. All the, of guns. We're gonna, look, we're going to name drop almost the whole entire coast when we're done with this podcast because <laughs> it makes me feel good to be on a podcast. And we know a lot of people. Yeah, we don't so. care. We're going to name drop so many things in life. And we love America. Yeah. Because that's God why bless we America. To do it. Give us a like, a share. Uh, tell your friends about us. Kobe Here. release. Talk to y'all next Kobe time. Kobe release project. Talk to you later. Peace. <laughs>